transformed into action. These two ambitious guys came to us and said, you know, we've got an idea here. Would you like to test it out with us? Which one is bigger? The teens teach students at Learning Help Centers of Charlotte, free of charge through their program, Tech for Intellect. What we try to do is we try to rethink STEM for the kids, if you will. Um, we try to do activities which I would say make STEM fun for them. So stuff like Lego robots and, you know, building towers and like competing against each other. Before the teens graduate, they want to expand their program's reach. If any community partners want to help us sponsor some grants so that we can, you know, build, get facilities or get equipment for their students to use, then we would also be very excited for that. I love that. And let's say you're a computer, right? The two teens want to use their privilege to give back. Robotics that we have at our school and whatnot, we tend to take, take those things for granted, I, I feel. Like, we have all these things and we just grew up with it. And we don't stop to think, like, other people are not even aware of this. The seniors have helped around 100 students in just under a year. Shamari Morrison, WCNC Charlotte. The new and improved WCNC Plus, now on Roku and Fire TV. Watch local live newscast, get extended breaking news coverage, and see local programs and specials. The new and improved WCNC Plus, now on Roku and Fire TV. As we get closer to the official start of fall, doctors are warning we're also getting closer to peak RSV season. RSV is a common virus that spreads easily and it's very dangerous for young children. WCNC Charlotte's Chloe Leshner explains. It's almost that time of year. <coughs> Common colds, flu, and RSV likely to run through classrooms and homes. RSV is the most common respiratory virus affecting kids under five. By age two, 100% of kids will have had RSV. It's a very transmissible virus by kids coughing on each other, sharing toys, touching the same doorknobs. Symptoms are typically a fever, runny nose, or cough, but doctors are warning it can escalate, becoming more dangerous if it hits the lungs. When we look at the statistics, it causes 2.1 million visits to the pediatrician every single season of RSV and 55,000 hospitalizations in the U.S. when it comes to pediatric um, population. It's the number one cause of hospitalization in those 12 months and below. With fewer COVID precautions in place, doctors say RSV is already spreading at an unusually high rate. They say parents should keep sick kids home, sanitize their toys, and keep them hydrated and healthy. But knowing when to call the pediatrician or go to the emergency department is key. But if it turns into a hacking cough that won't go away, if it turns into labored breathing, for example, they're using their little chest and it's moving up and down because they can't take a good deep breath. If they're not able to keep down fluids and they're becoming dehydrated or fatigued, this is a time to talk to your pediatrician, head to the emergency department. Chloe Lashner, WCNC Charlotte. This month, the Blumenthal Performing Arts Center hosting the Charlotte International Arts Festival. Wake Up Charlotte's Sarah French talks with one of the performers about what you can expect to see and a special connection he has with the music. Charlotte's first International Arts Festival just around the corner. It's a brand new event from Blumenthal Performing Arts that will bring more than 200 attractions to Charlotte over the course of 17 days. And joining us now, Donnie McClaslin, the artistic director of Black Star Symphony. He'll be performing September 16th and 17th. Donnie, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure, my pleasure. Really looking forward to coming down to Charlotte and being part of the festival. So tell us what people can expect from you. Well, they're gonna see um, David's final album, Black Star, uh, reimagined for full symphony orchestra and uh, my group, my, my group with Jason Linder and Nate Wood and three fantastic singers, John Cameron Mitchell, David Poe and Gail Ann Dorsey. So the, the first part of the program will be that, that record in its entirety. Um, and then we're gonna play some of his iconic songs that feel connected to me to the aesthetic of Black Star. So how did this all come about working with David Bowie? How did this happen and what was that like for you? Oh, well, I mean, it was just a transformative experience, you know, musically and and personally. I mean, he was just the greatest, you know, uh, 
just really exemplified, you know, so many things that I've always striven for as an artist. You know, he was courageous, uh, not afraid to look at different, you know, genres through his unique perspective. He was very present, you know, when we worked, um, always in the moment. And, you know, working with him, I, I when I talk about it with folks, I say, you know, I couldn't have imagined a more creative environment to work in because he really um, wanted us to do whatever we were hearing. You know, he gave us absolute freedom within the framework of these amazing songs that he had written. Star. What do you want people to walk away with when they see this show, this performance? What kind of experience do you want them to have? Well, I think a transformative experience. You know, I think this record was a hard one for people to listen to, you know, for a while because it was so connected with his passing. And and um, it's a great, rich record, though, with the, the lyrical content is so deep and so provocative. And, and so I think I want... I want it, we, we approached this as that music is a point of departure and that we wanted to, you know, take moments in these different songs and stretch them out with the orchestra and with the different orchestrators.
I welcome all of you to St. Giles Cathedral, the High Kirk, this ancient parish church of Edinburgh. Welcome to all around the world who are watching this service being broadcast. Here at St. Giles, John Knox confronted Mary, Queen of Scots. Here, James VI argued about liturgy. Here, Oliver Cromwell preached. Here, Parliament sometimes met. Here, our late Queen received the honours of Scotland and the stone of destiny rested on its return to Scotland. We are graced by the presence of the King and members of the Royal Family. Present here are representatives of our nation's life. Present here are people whose lives were touched by the Queen in so many unforgettable ways. And so we gather to bid Scotland's farewell to our late monarch, whose life of service to the nation and the world we celebrate, and whose love for Scotland was legendary. Let us worship God. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. The eternal God is our refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble.
eternal and ever-blessed God, receive us in your mercy and grant us the comfort and peace of your Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty and everlasting God, you send forth your Spirit and we are created. You richly endow us each with gifts to bring blessings to ourselves and to others. You enrich the life of our communities and our world. And at life's completion, you rejoice to welcome us into your nearer presence. We gather at this time a sorrowing nation, yet remembering with gratitude the long life and reign of your servant Elizabeth, our Queen, and for the many gifts and graces with which you endowed her, for her faithfulness to the trust committed to her, and for all the benefits which through her you have conferred upon this people. High King of Heaven, help us by the faith in which she lived and died to cherish those virtues which were dear to her heart and mind and bring us with her when our days on earth are ended into your heavenly presence and glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. For everything, there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, 
and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What gain have the workers from their toil? I have seen the business that God has given to everyone to be busy with. He has made everything suitable for its time. Moreover, he has put a sense of past and future into their minds. Yet they cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I know that there is nothing better for them than to be happy and enjoy themselves as long as they live. Moreover, it is God's gift that all should eat and drink and take pleasure in all their toil. I know that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done this so that all should stand in awe before him. That which is already has been. That which is to be already is. And God seeks out what has gone by. Here ends the first lesson.
A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own Son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us, who will separate us from the love of Christ, will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here ends the epistle.
reading from the Gospel according to St. John. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not let them be afraid. Here ends the Gospel. Death has been overcome. These are the words of hope expressed and centered around Jesus who died and rose again. And this is clearly something Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth acknowledged and personally embraced. These last few days, as tributes to Her Majesty have poured in, and we have watched images of her on screen from her earliest years, capturing that remarkable life, yet now beginning to sink in that she is gone from us, gone home to express her own words. Today we gather in this place of worship and throughout the nation to express our thanks to God for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth's extraordinary life. We are united in sorrow at the death of our monarch. But we are also so aware that His Majesty King Charles and all his family are not just grieving the loss of their Queen, but their mother, grandmother, and great grandmother too. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth began her reign like King Solomon by asking for wisdom something that she demonstrated in large measure and to which was added duty, honor, commitment, and faith. These are the words that we reach out for today to describe the life and the reign of Queen Elizabeth, whose passing is mourned not only in her native land, but across the Commonwealth and the world as has been so evident to us in these recent days. Most of us cannot recall a time when she was not our monarch. Committed to the role she assumed in 1952 upon the death of her beloved father, she has been a constant in all of our lives for over 70 years. She was determined to see her work as a form of service to others. And she maintained that steady course until the end 
of her life. People who were in her company always felt that they were being listened to carefully and attentively and with compassion. She possessed a sharp, intelligent mind with amazing recall, a kindly heart, and a gentle sense of humor. She understood the breadth of world affairs and also cared about what happened to all of her people. And although sometimes buffeted by events around her, she continually and resolutely and cheerfully fulfilled her responsibilities. And so today we give thanks not only for the length of her reign, but for the qualities she displayed so steadfastly. We recall also with gratitude the many who have supported her throughout her reign. We think especially of the Duke of Edinburgh, who stood faithfully beside her through their 73 years of marriage, bringing his own energy and intellect to the service of the monarchy. Much has been said about the Queen's contribution to the life of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth, which meant so much to her. But here in Scotland, we acknowledge with gratitude her deep links with our land and its people. Her love of the Balmoral Estate is well known, and being there latterly brought her great comfort. There she was valued as a neighbor and a friend, and there she drew strength and refreshment during the summer months. She was active in the life of Civic Scotland, traveling across the country to support numerous causes, entertaining guests at Holyrood Palace and presiding at ceremonial events, many of which took place in this church. Here she received the Scottish Crown in 1953, an event vividly memorialized in the painting by Orcadian artist Stanley Cursiter. Her links with the Scottish churches were also deep and lasting. She was the Supreme Governor of the Church of England, but she worshipped in the Church of Scotland here north of the border, in Canongate Kirk, especially at Crathy Kirk, where she took her pew each Sunday morning, prevented from doing so latterly only by infirmity. She perceived little difficulty in belonging to two churches and appreciating the strength of each. It is clearly evident and without doubt that the Queen's Christian faith was genuine and often gave clear and sincere expression when there were those remarkable Christmas broadcasts. She spoke unashamedly of her trust in God and of the example and teaching of Jesus Christ, whom she sought to follow as best she could. Indeed, of that faith, she said, she had no regret. Her focus on family, on community, on reaching across divisions and differences were evident to us throughout these short yet meaningful festive messages. For 70 years she reigned as our Queen. She has been present among us as a follower of Christ and as a member of his church. And for that and much else beside, we give thanks to God together here this day. Today we mourn her passing but we also celebrate the long and happy reign that we experienced with her. And we pray God's blessing upon King Charles, who will surely draw strength from his mother's example and the many affectionate tributes of these days, 
and from our assurance to him as a church of our steadfast prayers at all times and of our unstinting support to him as was offered to his mother, the Queen. Let us pray. God of all grace, we thank you that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to break the power of death and to bring life and immortality to light through the gospel. He shared our life, took upon himself our death, and opened the kingdom of heaven to all who trust in him. Look not on us, but look on us as found in him and bring us safely through judgment to the joy and peace of your presence. Most gracious God, with all our hearts, we thank you for the long life, the shining example, the steadfast commitment to duty, the strong faith, and the good humor of our wise and great Queen. We thank you for the deep love she has inspired from all her subjects, for the myriad ways in which she met and welcomed people from all walks of life, for the diplomacy with which she resolved conflict, and for the stability she brought to her realms and to the Commonwealth. For the life and example of our Queen. With all our hearts, we give you thanks. For the King in the role he now assumes. Grant and comfort and wisdom and blessing, O God. God of mercy, 
We pray your comfort to all members of the royal family in their time of grief and loss. Enfold them in your love, we pray you. Uphold them in their sorrow and grant that they may be confident of your mercy and the promises made to us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah, right. Look with compassion, we pray you, upon the King as he assumes the office to which you have called him. Endow him with that spirit with which you blessed and guided the Queen these many years, that he may walk in the joy of your strength and be affirmed by the love of his people throughout this kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for all in our nation that we may live according to the standards set by our beloved Queen, that we may continually uphold in prayer our King as he seeks discernment and wisdom for his calling, and that together we may seek justice and prosperity for all people in this land. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray. We pray for wisdom to become worthy stewards of your good gifts. Give to us a constant concern for the earth and all its creatures, a spirit of understanding in our dealings with others and keep the nations of our commonwealth united, united in bonds of cooperation and friendship. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, from whose love nothing can separate us, we commend to your kindness one another here and all people engulfed of sorrow of any kind, we pray for the peace of the world and for just dealings between the nations. We pray for the hungry and the poor, for those displaced by conflict, for all who suffer hardship and do not enjoy the benefits which we have known in our day and generation. We pray together as our Saviour taught us. Our Father, our Father which art in heaven, in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
now go out into the world and be of good courage. Render no one evil for evil, but hold fast to the good. Honor all of God's children, love and serve the Lord in the power of the Spirit and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love this day, this night, and even forevermore.